Yeah, again, repeating the same line. So I bring only problems to plumbers, and <laughs> I don't bring solutions here. And when I bring problems, I when I return back, I always have some solutions in hand. So um, this idea came up like Tim uh, brought this. Like we had the initial dis like in last plumbers, like we discussed some of these Linux boot time issues that we were facing when we were dealing with the end products that uh, TI delivers to its customers, and then. Tim asked me to run an, another follow-up session. So whatever problems and learnings we have seen in last uh, one year, I thought I will summarize those things and share here. Um, some of these are already solved in some, uh, some way, but uh, they are not productized today. Like productized, upstream, these are the gaps that we have today. So um, in, in a nutshell, if I have to say, Boot time is not like how you hit to the prompt faster, right? That is not what is meant by boot time for us. Like, it's mainly what use cases you can cover while you are booting the software on any given SOC. Now, the, by use case, I mean like you might have hit the prompt within a second or maybe like 500 milliseconds, but after that, if you have nothing in your system to even play an audio sound or to show something on a display or run, uh, res give a CAN response or a network response, then that boot has no meaning, right? So how do we ensure that whatever boot we have uh, done has some meaning or is, some, is meaningful? So the scope of this session is to come up with those areas where we have, uh, what we have dealt uh, in last one year and see what problems and challenges we faced in those uh, problem areas and see how we have resolved in some cases and where they are still open for us. So that's the uh, intention of this. Now when, when I talk about boot time, right, like there are some uh, fixed functions which we cannot do much about it. They are all like uh, uh, if, if kernel boot has taken 500 millisecond or even one second, some of this, uh, some of that uh, like majority of that time has gone into executing fixed function. And that fix, fixed function is because of your hardware limitation or your SOC limitation or your system limitation. Now, for example, instead of using um, OSPI for your flash uh, access, if we have used one bit flash or four bit flash, the speed of that read is going to be slow anyways, right? And if you are not operating EMMC at a given rate, then your fetching of that uh, image is going to be uh, on a higher scale. Sim similarly, if you are authenticating the image, like how you, what your secure accelerator is in your system and what type of mechanism you are following for secure boot, all those things play a very important role while defining your boot time optimization. So the, where is your image size? Uh, what is the size of the image? Where is it located? How are you fetching it? How are you authenticating it? How are you decrypting it, authenticating it, and then loading it into DDR? How much time have you taken to initialize your DDR? And uh, <clears throat> so all those, whether it is a 16-bit DDR or 32-bit DDR, all these things play a very significant role in defining your boot time. Now, th these things are, as I said, system-specific things. So this is nothing to do with open source or kernel or bootloader, right? Like the, here we have to live with whatever system we have. We try to, we are enforcing, like in TI now we are taking boot time uh, as very important topic. So when we are defining our new SOC, we initially think now if you put this security accelerator, is that sufficient for me to uh, get to the boot time of one millisecond or something? or one second or something. So <laughs> one millisecond, I raised my bar on myself. I'm sorry, <laughs> that is wrong. <laughs> Remove from the record, one second, OK. So we have to uh, deal with those things. So we, we are taking those measures when we are making our EVM, whether we should put OSPI or OSPI NAR or OSPI NAND, EMMC. Based on the applications, we make those systems uh, thing. So this is the first problem. And solution here is like define your system in the right order, pick your right device, right peripherals, pick uh, uh, whatever clock rate, uh, all such things matter here. The second problem, uh, which is pretty much uh, 
something which we do uh, in combination with bootloader and kernel, right? These are something called early use cases. Now, we can't wait for kernel to boot to prompt and then do, um, uh, then do play a tone or uh, give some early logo on your display. Now, these are called as early use cases, pretty common in uh, automotive world. And also now we are seeing this being used in uh, many embedded uh, systems. So here, what happens now, I, I, I turned on the power of the product and immediately the expectation is to see a, if it is a display with head unit, a simple logo should come up as quickly as possible. A tone should be played if it, is an, uh, if it has an audio device. Uh, an LED should glow, power LED should be visible, right? Now, these things you can do after the kernel boot, but then you are taking your system to one second to two seconds away. Now, if you want to do much earlier in the system, then you put all these, your, all these functionality in your bootloader itself. So we maintain two bootloaders. One we go with standard U-boot and try to do something in SPL and U-boot and then go into the kernel. We also have our own secondary bootloader, which is an RTOS-based application, which tries to do things more faster uh, compared to U-boot. But uh, whatever we do in U-boot, the biggest problem that we have here is how do you notify to, uh, how do you notify kernel that I have already initialized the hardware? Now you don't reset the system. Now you, uh, in bootloader, I already uh, have uh, splash running and then I showed a logo. Then the uh, kernel takes over and now kernel, if it resets the display subsystem, it will show a glitch or something on the system, right? When your audio, similarly with your audio or your connectivity interfaces, like if you have a network port or CAN or USB or something, you initially started giving response responses from bootloader and when you get into kernel now you're resetting the interface so you will see that interface going down and again coming up now there is no easy way to communicate from bootloader to kernel that this in these peripherals and interfaces are initialized now don't do anything or don't touch this or don't reinitialize things or if you are reinitializing again like at what kilohertz will you reinitialize and all those things matter so this is one problem that we are seeing uh, on how to communicate. Like on display, we have a mechanism with a simple frame buffer uh, DT node, which can pass on this information that I have run a splash. Now don't reconfigure it and kernel can take care of it. But similar thing, similar hooks are not available for networking and other systems. Now, if you play something in audio, that is a strange issue, right? Like if we, like how, how, like what is the duration of the tone that you are playing? Now, if you are playing a tone for like minimum thing is like one or two seconds, right? Like you should, an audible tone is at least one or two seconds. Now, if you play one or two seconds tone and if you leave it on a DMA or something, maybe that works. But if you are in a loop or something, that means you are delaying your boot time by two seconds. If you are holding the boot of kernel and not giving a parallel uh, boot while your bootloader has finished audio tone playback. Now this is another thing that we need to see like how, how is it going to impact the boot time while your tone is being played from the bootloader itself. The Sorry, that's a question. Be, instead of um, uh, communicating, communicating between U-boot and the kernel, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be better to eliminate U-boot completely and just immediately go to we the do. kernel? There is, we, we also do Falcon boot in many cases where SPL directly jumps to kernel and uh, it does, kernel takes over. Now, to do anything in kernel space, you need to come up with your own services, uh, right? Like if you want to play an audio tone, now you cannot in introduce that audio tone playback in the driver itself. Now it has to come from an application. Now you have to have your services running, ALSA running, then application kickstarting, and then that thread should run to play a tone. Yeah, but my point is, I, I think it will be easier to have a, um, to implement an, an, a fast path, fast path initialization in the kernel than it is to have a stable interface between the U-boot and kernel to, to propagate driver state, because the thing is, um, Whatever you communicate between U-boot and the kernel will depend on this, the, the way that the driver is implemented in U-boot and the way that it's implemented in the kernel. Um, and it's, I think it's going to be horribly complicated to, 
to do this in a, in a somewhat generic way. So, <clears throat> so uh, uh, just a preview of coming attractions. Uh, DT might not be the best interface to use because I'm trying to get rid of DT. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's controversial. We'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, so if you do it with command line parameters, there's already a fair number of command line options that, that tweak behavior of drivers right at startup and, and reduce boot time. So <clears throat> I kind of wonder about that. What about boot config? Uh, or, you know, the, there's that other mechanism for handing data into the kernel. So I think it'd be great to come up with some kind of standard for, you know, if a driver, if a peripheral's already initialized, you know, somehow notify the driver, but you're right, we need standards for that. There are multiple ways of doing it. I'm not uh, denying that, right? Like you can eliminate U-boot, directly jump with over SPL to kernel, do Falcon boot and in initialize your interfaces faster in the kernel. But then you are still limiting yourself. Like the, the performance in uh, number that we get, like, we need can response within 100 milliseconds. We need audio first chime within 500 milliseconds. We need camera if you put in reverse gear and you want to start your camera within one second. So these are some of the requirements that we get uh, as soon as you boot your product. Uh, each product use cases are different, right? Like now in order to meet that, you can start doing tweaks and tricks. It is possible, but it is it becomes like hacks instead of becoming something which you can carry in uh, your software for long. It won't become a standard product offering uh, in cases like these. This is one problem. Anyway, I will uh, highlight all the problems, then we can definitely, I'll give more time to discuss these. So, uh, uh, I have a question about uh, Ethernet. Uh, so if you initialize the link in uh, bootloader and pass it to the kernel, I understand that it uh, saves the time, but uh, actually there is no data transfer possible. I mean, there's package loss and so on. Why do we fake it? We don't have to. Like, there are some cases where we are requested to give early Ethernet, uh, like where you want to start your response on network packets. Like, you just have to say that my interface is alive. Like, if you have connect, um, if you have an audio interface connected over network, like, uh, if your peripherals are connected over network um, or in car where the peripherals are connected over network, you have to initially give a response to a first packet. So you give response and after that you can continue your stack later as well. But this is only for an early uh, response to your initial packets. The use case is only for early packet uh, response. Cut fell. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> So then there are some combo use cases. So what I explained initially was like, uh, how do you do early use cases? Now, in early use case, how you do display plus audio together, or camera plus connectivity, or display plus connectivity kind of things. Now, again, these things are like, while you are playing your display logo, you also want to have your audio running in parallel, and you want to give like audio plus a tone and a logo together, right? Now, if you want to do this in bootloader, again, it becomes complicated because U-boot is not multi-threaded. So, like I just pasted a link where Deng said that. Um, so, you can't, you have to either start audio first and then start your display or start display first and then start audio. Then both of these things, you need to take it to kernel and continue processing uh, later in the kernel uh, um, in Linux world, right? Like, so that, that becomes a second issue what we just uh, described. So here the issue is like, how do you do sequential things like one after the other? The second thing is how do you communicate to kernel that these peripherals are in initialized? So this is combination of one and two. The problem four uh, is like when you have remote cores in your device where you have multiple DSPs or multiple microcontrollers which are used to do some kind of um, initialization. Now, there is an MCU which is handling an ADC to read some sensor data or something. Now, 
when you boot the device, the MCU is up first and it is starting, uh, it is re re responding to some packets or it is, uh, it is initializing the ADC and reading some sensor information or it is initializing the camera and starting uh, like collecting the initial frames or it is like if it is a display cluster use case where you can initialize the display and show some initial telltales like immediately it will show some telltales there and then Linux boots on A-Core and it takes over the display and other peripherals. So in such use cases, again, like how do you, how can the remote core, the remote core in this case is the MCUs and DSP notify to the Linux kernel saying, I have already initialized these peripherals. Now you don't initialize it again, or if you initialize, initialize in the same order, right? So the, there are no standards for these things. The reason why I'm bringing these topics here is while you are doing Linux boot optimization, these issues are addressed today in the, in the industry, but with, by following all the tweaks and tricks without following a standard mechanism or a standard process. And what I have done, somebody might have done in a different way, and I don't know whether they have done it or not in the right order or something, or I might be wrong. Now, how do we uh, collaborate and um, how, how do we work together? So my fourth slide is mainly summarizing the issues that uh, I just explained in last four uh, slides. So basically, the important aspect here is like, if we have to discuss anything related to boot time and boot time optimizations and these things, what is the good and right channel for us to discuss these things or bring up these topics, right? Like, as I said, if we go to a networking mailing list or anything, then it becomes like more towards networking uh, concepts or you go into media or you go into audio or uh, display. They are very specific to those subsystems. Now, the, the, the issue that we are dealing is like bootloader, optimizations, and then the frameworks, right? So where should we discuss these kind of uh, boot time boot time tics, tips and tricks one issue second thing where do we host these uh, topics that we have like if i have made a hack and i want to come pass on this method what i have done to in the kernel to optimize uh, the boot time and still show a logo or play an audio or something where do i host these things like is there a project where we can host these uh, tips and tricks which we can pass on and later fine tune it more. Like maybe the initial step that I have taken is wrong, but I also want to s review this with the community. And if there are better ways to do it, I want to learn and implement those things in our uh, standard offering. That is one part. Second thing is on uh, file systems, right? Like file system also plays a very important role in boot time. Now, what should be the minimum file system that should be given for optimized boot time and how that file system will scale later to um, cater to the end product needs. Like if you start adding lot of services or lot of packages, lot of applications in your file system, the amount of time it would take to mount that and boot those services is going to take time, right? So in our case, what we have done, we have multiple Yocto wiki images. Like when you build for a defined OE config, we actually give <coughs> five different wiki images. Now, first is very thin uh, wiki image. Then there is uh, something which runs with Docker, something which is default, which is blown up with all the packages. So we have some basic default, thin, tiny kind of thing for different use cases and different sizes. So this is one thing which we have done, maybe not the right way to do, but this solves one of our purpose of dealing with boot time and solving uh, issues related to file systems. So, and the other last item is like, how do we do test automation for these things, right? Like uh, today, like we were discussing, I was discussing with Tim also brought this up, like in kernel CI, can we have a test to monitor the boot time uh, of kernel? Like, and is it changing every release, like every RC? Is, it, is anything in the kernel impacting the boot time, right? And uh, how do we see from version to version what is the boot time? Today we have uh, RT tests for real-time cyclic tests are published, right? Similarly, can we have some uh, standard test which actually gives the boot time with every RC or every major release kernel version so that we know how much we are deviating on the boot time. 
and that is also challenging on us like when we want to do display plus boot time audio plus boot time these things have to be uh, automated auto automatically tested and results to be published so this is all i had i wanted to just share my experiences and the problems that we have faced and uh, how we have solved in some form but we we have all this code on our github repository today which you can see and refer and you can reach out to us we can always share our documentation and the hacks that we have done but if there is a collaborative project then definitely i would like to participate and uh, post all our code there to uh, help the community okay so <clears throat> uh, i actually have almost the same set of uh, of uh, requests in terms of uh, where do we do this stuff as you have. So <clears throat> is there any reason we can't use the Linux embedded mailing list, the actual kernel Linux embedded mailing list? It's a defunct list. Nobody's on it except every once in a while you get a, a support question from someone. But but it's uh, it's not being used for anything else. And I think this is exactly the type of discussion that should go on there. Uh, that means that we have to like stop ignoring that list and kind of get on if we were going to collaborate on on some things. But that would be my suggestion for a mailing list. Uh, as far as a wiki, uh, I'm going to put my stuff in. Uh, I have some tools that I've developed, um, and I'm going to put it on the eLinux wiki under the boot time topic. Uh, and then for I am actually working on a layer, a meta layer for Yocto that I'm going to also put the tools in. Uh, so, but there's no, I don't know of a, any place where we're having a project. So I don't know if anyone has any, you know, like. Wiki is a good uh, place to start. At least we can give all the links for the, yeah. um, for, for the patches that we are carrying in a particular repository. So yeah, if there is a wiki page, definitely I would like to participate and add. Meta layer will be very interesting, like if you can share. Yeah, but, but like it's going to be under, it's not going to be under like Sony's repository. It'll be like my personal repository so I'm not it's not a very official place for such things so I don't know Are there any other any other comments uh, maybe you should uh, select one of those uh, use cases where you transfer an active device the kernel from the bootloader and figure out a way to how to suggest such an interface and submit that to the relative uh, relevant kernel subsystem and to the device tree maintainers probably to see, uh, to at least get the discussion started that there are these use cases and give a concrete example how that could be done. And we have done one for uh, spl early splash screen. We have done those things and the patches were also submitted and we also have um, given the talk related to that in ELC and other places like how we have implemented those things. Um, case by case basis like we are working with the respective uh, community and uh, projects there so uh okay i'll wait i have a comment but... uh, okay if i might uh, add some comments uh, in ubu there is like the boot stage facility uh, that you can pass some information regarding the what has been achieved in which boot stage so this is already there, available. You can pass information between the SPL to U-boot, and then you would know which stage you pass. And the second comment, I don't know if it's still possible, but with the IMX, I remember that there was the information device tree that you can specify that this pin, for example, is already configured by the bootloader. If I remember correctly, it might change, but some time ago, it was possible to specify in the NXP device tree that, okay, this IP block, this pin, whatever, is already configured by the bootloader. This was special flag, if I remember correctly. So that was solving the problem with the glitches on the display because you didn't reconfigure the, the pins, which caused the glitch, and also some networking, I think. Excuse me? All right. Before I send it back there, I just wanted to comment. One of the one of the okay. So boot time is one of these things that I call um, systemic throughout the kernel, right? So it's like real time or or power management or size system size. System size was really hard to kind of get an ecosystem around because you're removing code. So there's no maintainer 
until you got until you hit the individual thing. But if you want to do some kind of systemic reduction of size, uh, it's like there is no maintainer. And it's the same thing with boot time. There's no boot time maintainer in the kernel. And so that's I think one of the things that makes it a difficult proposition. So I I think it's really good to try and get some kind of uh, group together, uh, even if it's informal, to, to work on this stuff and collaborate. So, and there was one. Right so, just for the record, you can kind of do that already in DRM uh, for the display side of things. Um, so, it's not generic yet, but we have a plan for it because Intel is already kind of taking over a device that is running so that you can have flicker, fl uh, flicker free boot, sorry. So, yeah, it's not generic, but it's doable, and we have a plan for it. So, yeah, if you want to, it's something we can discuss some more, and yeah. Um, how much do we really care about cold boot these days and not, like, resuming quickly from suspend, right? Because, like, Tim, you mentioned two systemic problems are boot time and power management. Maybe we can combine some efforts there and actually work on them both. and. And, and I think a lot of these use cases, I mean, cars have really big batteries. I don't know that they really ever turn off, do they? I mean, maybe we should be looking at, I mean, obviously I know some of them do, but I mean, in a lot of use cases, I think we could be optimizing, working on suspend resume uh, uh, speed ups, and it could also have a lot of, have similar benefits to like the, the use cases you're talking about, not from cold boots. With Linux RT. So we have uh, Linux RT plus power, so we need to solve both for this. I, I said we need to solve Linux RT and power because most of these use cases are running on RT Linux. So th that's one thing that I was discussing with you yesterday, right? Like how do we solve RT Linux and power in some cases? So okay, we've got about one minute left, so time for maybe one more question. Nice seeing you all. <laughs> Thank you for staying around. Okay, thanks.